welcome here with us. Welcome to the first of a long series of online events happening this month. Um, as you may know, uh, the Florence School of Regulation has moved fully online, and we would like to invite you to take this uh, disruptive moment as, a, as an opportunity to learn something new and maybe to find new ways of interacting and sharing knowledge worldwide. That's why we are here today um, with a special webinar from the Energy Union Law Area of the Florence School of Regulation. In this uh, webinar, uh, Professor Lee Ancher and uh, Dr. Francesco Salerno will discuss the latest decision from the European Court of Justice, Justice relating to the energy sector, and they will walk us through a selection of four key cases. Um, uh, of course, you are welcome to interact with them via the chat. Uh, we will have some moments for Q&A during the event. Thank you very much, and I would like to give the floor to Francesco to start. Thank you, Chiara, and thank you to FSR for making this possible. I think it's very good that we can be here together virtually. Nowadays, virtually also means safely. So I think these moments are precious because they bring us together and we have an opportunity to share knowledge and, uh, and spend some time together in a constructive way. I also want to, to say that probably many of you have been drawn to this seminar uh, because it's going to deal with state aid and maybe not so much because of the energy sector. Because it is fair to say that uh, perhaps state aid has never been so popular as it is nowadays. I think that the um, the, the cases that we are going to to discuss with you, which pertain to the energy sector, have very fruitful lessons also for state aid in the moment we are living. I think this is a bit of a vocation of the uh, state aid sector, state aid in the energy sector, because prior to the times we are living today, there was so much public spending in energy that the wealth of cases has surfaced, and these cases have uh, illuminated the application of state aid for a many many other sectors and and for the community of, of state aid lawyers practitioners administrators and beneficiaries at large so with that i think i will immediately start with a case which deals with the one of the key components of a uh, state aid germany versus commission And uh, it's, it's a case that uh, deals with the state resources. I think the, um, the case takes place in, in a specific setting, uh, the setting of the funding mechanism in Germany for the production of electricity from renewable energy sources. And that setting had a number of uh, bilateral relationships. And uh, if I may put it this way, um, an incomplete legislative mechanism in the sense that at least one of the bilateral relationships was not covered by an obligation to pass on charges and i think the, the specificity of uh, this setting have led to a very interesting uh, judgment uh, on state resources i think the, the the general point about the judgment which again goes beyond energy is a uh, is the test for finding state resources 
And I think that test has been distinguished by, uh, uh, has been distinguished from the standard of proof to meet that test. So I want to uh, bring you maybe directly to the, uh, the relevant holdings and give you my, my takeaway. I think the, the, the test on the existence of state resources is a test which deals with the ability of the state to control money flows. If you compare measures in the energy sector to the ones we are seeing today, I think the distinction becomes apparent. Nowadays, we see measures drawing from the state budget. There is no doubt that the state has full ability to control those type of resources. I think that that test is more difficult to apply in a setting when the state has decided to fund an activity outside the state budget and calls upon customers, private parties to contribute to that activity. The, the channeling of funds for res producers, I think it's a textbook example of how uh, all of us as energy consumers contribute to that uh, uh, activity. And here, I think what the court has done is to confirm uh, that the test of the ability of the state to control money flows is the relevant test in these type of settings. At the same time, the court has um, clarified the, the standard of proof that it requires from the Commission for that test to be met. So I think this case, uh, it's certainly it's a, it's a defining case in the space of state resources and state aid. I think it must be read, at least that, that is the, the thought I'd like to, to share with you, by uh, bearing in mind a distinction between the test and the standard of proof. And uh, I think that leads me to the other case that I wanted to discuss with you, which is still on state resources and came a few months after Germany versus Commission. I'll move quickly through the slides. I think we have produced way uh, more slides than we are going to discuss with you, but hopefully not they can be a useful reference after the seminar so i'll i'll skip and i'll take you directly to the point in this case if this is a check case uh, where the link uh, with the previous case and state resources it's uh, it's clearer just for your background this case also has a, has a rich history uh, it dates back to 2003 and because of it, this history, there's a, also a lot of discussion about legitimate expectations in relation to an earlier commission letter. There's a discussion whether it was a letter or a decision. I think for the sake of this webinar, we can move directly into uh, the point about state resources. And the, perhaps what I want to, to draw your attention to in this case, it's um, um, on the type of debate that on the back of uh, uh, Germany versus Commission, the court entertains uh, be because I think one of the key points about this case, for example, was about the legislative setting in the, uh, in the relevant country, whether there was an obligation or not to uh, pass on the, the, the charge that it's at the origin of the, that it, it's the legal, legal mechanism to, to levy the funds. And I think the lesson for the case is that um, there's more and more an ability to, to understand the specific uh, legal framework of the member state that one deals with. Uh, and a need to, to read that legal framework with the prism 
the court imposes in terms of understanding the money flows and the ability of the state to control that money flow. I think another point about this judgment uh, uh, that I want to share with you before I hand over for the other set of cases we want to discuss in this first part with you is also um, how uh, rich the, 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 the space has become and how much the court has to distinguish one case from the other. Um, and I think that that is a complexity also for all of us in, in the state aid community, whether you are a private practice or a public administrator or a regulator, that uh, uh, you need to find your way through a number of nuances and the specific way in which a national uh, legislation, the national mechanism to fund a certain activity is designed can make the difference, that can bring you inside or outside uh, the state aid world. I think I, I will stop there for my first part uh, and hand over to uh, Professor Hanscher. Just before I do that, just a housekeeping if you want. This case is on appeal. The case, the check case I just discussed is on appeal. Uh, and again, it's going to be an interesting point to see what the Court of Justice does uh, on the notion of the levy and whether the existence of a levy is a, a, is a prerequisite for a funding of state resources and in turn of aid. I think with that, I hand over. Thank you. Okay, can you all hear me? Good morning, everybody, and um, thank you for joining uh, the event today. And I'd particularly like to thank everybody at uh, the FSR um, who have made this possible. It's not always easy in these circumstances when everyone's working at home and trying to get used to a different environment and also uh, wrestle, in my case, with the technology. Um, and I'm very pleased that we have such um, a large um, number of people participating today. Um, I hope that uh, you're all having a good Friday and uh, that you're all safe and well. So I am going to take us to the next um, um, set of cases, um, which are the ones on the institutional aspects. And um, I've selected two cases here um, to discuss. Um, one you might have already heard about, uh, eControl versus Acer. Um, this case concerns uh, what we call terms, conditions, and methodologies. Um, these are rules that can be adopted under the network codes and particularly the guidelines. Um, and in this case, um, we're looking at the, the CACM, um, the Capacity Allocation Congestion Management Guidelines in the electricity sector. Um, what are the main takeaways and what are the implications for pending cases? That's primarily what I want to look at. Well, the problem here was um, that um, the procedures by which ACER became competent to make a decision on the, the proposals submitted by the TSOs um, to uh, delineate capacity calculation regions um, had not been followed to the letter. Uh, this was because one uh, NRA, eControl, um, had submitted um, more or less at the last moment, you could say, an amendment request um, to what um, had been, um, up until that point, a common proposal um, by the NRAs. Um, so, in normal circumstances, ACER becomes competent either because the NRAs cannot reach a decision uh, within a certain period of time, usually six months, um, on these terms and conditions, so the, the matter can be referred to ACER, or alternatively, the NRAs can decide jointly uh, that they are in disagreement uh, on certain issues, and they can request ACER um, to arbitrate between them. 
Um, now, what happened here was um, that um, the NRAs um, thought that they had reached a decision to refer, um, and they thought they had reached agreement um, on certain issues, uh, but there were others that were outstanding. And then um, eControl, just prior to that request being submitted, um, requested an amendment. Now, this case um, is very interesting um, because it concerns the interpretation of ACER's powers uh, to adopt terms, conditions, and methodologies under the procedures uh, that are provided. Um, in this case, the regulation um, 714 of 209, but of course that has now been replaced uh, by the new regulation. Um, but the powers that we're looking at here um, are actually reproduced in, in the new regulation. Um, so um, eControl um, were not terribly happy that they had um, been sidelined, if you like, and that their amendment had not been taken into account. And they, uh, and a number of other parties, challenged uh, the decision of ACER to ACER's Board of Appeal. And in, as far as I'm aware, this is the first successful challenge um, to a Board of Appeal decision. Uh, we've got many more in the pipeline. You'll see at the end of the presentation, we've got a list of up-and-coming cases, um, but this is the first. And what's interesting is that of the six pleas that were put um, put forward uh, by eControl, the, um, the court only actually decided on number two, uh, highlighted here in bold, um, which essentially came down um, to a procedural flaw that the Board of Appeal, uh, when it looked at ACER's decision and upheld that decision, actually, it erred in law uh, because it considered that ACER was actually authorized to disregard the amendment uh, request by eControl and that, it was, that ACER was actually competent to adopt the decision. Um, so the other pleas some of which actually are particularly interesting, especially the first one, um, which went to the very competence um, of um, ACER to decide on this very um, political issue of uh, capacity calculation regions that was not taken up, nor the uh, equally, I think, um, problematic concept of congestion was not taken up either. So uh, the court, the general court, sidestepped uh, these um, substantive legal questions and focused really on this um, issue here. Now, um, ACER and a number of other um, com countries or NRAs intervening claimed that um, ACER should have been competent because otherwise the procedures would become far too complicated. Um, everyone has to decide things within fairly strict timelines and um, if um, one single NRA could come with a, an amendment request at the last moment, uh, that would add to uh, delays and complications. So that was essentially the argument that in the interest of efficiency, um, ACER should have been given, if you like, the benefit of the doubt. Um, it knew about the amendment's request. Um, it apparently took it into account. So it was really only a formality um, that had been ignored here. Um, now, the, the court actually uh, wasn't too keen on that argument. It looks at Article 9 of the CACM, uh, of the guideline, which sets out uh, the various procedures uh, for adopting terms, conditions, and methodologies, and the different way in which ACER becomes involved. And very importantly, at um, Recital 69 of its decision, it doesn't um, express very much sympathy for this argument about um, effectiveness, that ACER um, should be given then um, a decision-making competence based on the need to um, ensure that it can um, be effective. Um, so what the, the court says was you cannot, uh, if you like, remedy a gap in the procedures with a claim um, of effectiveness. That is not sufficient in itself to create a competence. So the, the, the court has been strict here and um, looked at the, the very specific competences that ACER has and will not go beyond, uh, beyond that. So a very important uh, ruling. It has not been challenged. 
and um, therefore um, we will have to um, see uh, what will happen in some of the new cases which we'll list later on. Now the other important case which has uh, been appealed um, and which I think uh, uh, many, many people have uh, heard about um, because it's, it's created quite, um, you could say, a, a little storm um, amongst uh, EU lawyers generally and uh, energy lawyers uh, in particular is the case of Poland versus the Commission, the OPAL case. And again, I will uh, look at these three um, headings, what's it about. Um, I will try and uh, take uh, the main takeaway from it and uh, have a look at the pending cases. Um, so here we are, here it is. Here's the OPAL pipeline. And as you can see, it's connected to Nord Stream, which itself, of course, um, is a very controversial project. We have Nord Stream 1 already built and Nord Stream 2 um, in the process of being completed. Um, um, and so the OPAL pipeline uh, is, is connecting then the Nord Stream and bringing um, gas down into um, southern Europe, through north into southern Europe. Uh, now, OPAL um, was given an exemption um, under uh, the gas directive um, by um, the German regulator, which was then confirmed by uh, the Commission. However, um, for various reasons, which we don't have time to go into here, um, that um, exemption decision was amended. And uh, so it was amended by the German regulator, and that amendment was confirmed by the Commission. Now, every step of, of the way has led to, to um, various challenges, um, particularly uh, by, by Poland. Um, and those challenges have met with varying degrees of success. Uh, but we could say that um, I think the that Poland really hit the jackpot uh, with their arguments in, in this particular case, in the OPAL case, um, because what they claimed was um, that um, the Commission's decision should be annulled because the Commission had failed to take into account the principle of energy solidarity, which um, is anchored in uh, the only article we have in the Treaty on energy, and uh, that's Article 194. Um, <clears throat> and in the eyes of the Polish government, supported uh, by uh, the General Court, um, this is not just a, a political principle. It's not just a statement of, of, um, of political uh, will, if you like, or an ideal, um, but it's also a legal criterion. And the idea behind it is that um, and it's probably very important to remember it in these uh, difficult times um, that the EU and the member states should endeavour um, in the exercise of their respective powers to avoid adopting measures which are likely to affect the interests of the EU and other member states. And of course, in the energy area, and that's particularly the case when it comes to security of supply, um, political um, viability, economic viability, diversification of supply, etc. So in order to make sure um, that that principle is honoured, um, in taking decisions, both the EU and the member states should honour then um, the principle of de facto solidarity and interdependence. And when the Commission took its decision um, confirming uh, the changes to the exemption uh, for OPAL that uh, the German regulator had allowed, um, it had failed to look at the effects of its decision on um, the Polish gas market in particular and the European gas market as a whole. And so that decision uh, should be annulled. Um, so that was um, a very um, a very revolutionary um, ruling, you could say, uh, those of your followers of the case law on solidarity might have seen that uh, on Wednesday this week we've had another important case on solidarity, but this time, this time, um, I have to say the tables have been turned, and it's Poland who has um, not honoured that principle uh, when it comes to uh, the refugee crisis. Um, so it has become a very important principle in uh, European law, and. Um, it will be interesting to see um, how um, 
the Court of Justice will deal with the appeal that has been launched, um, which um, claims that um, the uh, principle is, is like the principle of subsidiarity, you could say. It is not um, a binding legal criterion. It's a political aspiration, and it cannot give right to specific uh, rights and obligations for either the EU or for the member states. So that is um, a very interesting case to watch. It will have really wide-reaching, uh, I think, implications if the Court of Justice upholds the general court. It will mean that the Commission and the member states will have to take their decisions on many matters in the energy field in a very different way. Right. So we're back. Um, we're back to the man in the attic, and. Uh, Francesco, you're taking over. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, public service obligations. Again, uh, the root is in the energy sector, but the, the lessons go beyond the energy sector. I think the case I wanted to discuss first uh, has to do with the uh, cylinders of bottled LPG. If you allow me a. I think these are the, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this type of energy source. Uh, I, I do, I come from an island, I come from Sicily, and there are some parts of the island which are not connected to a gas network, and so if you want to, to cook, uh, you, you need to use these the cylinders. So this case brought back memories of uh, summer spent in places either by the sea or in mountain where you need these cylinders to cook your pasta and I hope that those times come back for all of us very soon and um, with that in mind um, I think the case uh, it's interesting because it uh, um, it connects to a, um, to a case law which is very rich it's the uh, Peder Utility case, another an Italian case. And the other thing to bear in mind is that uh, the, this is a case, uh, it's a case without, without state money. So it's a case of public service obligations without the, compo the, the, the potential state aid component. I think in this case, the, the, the public service obligation related to an obligation to deliver the, the, the cylinders and uh, to observe a maximum price. Uh, these are obligations that to a, some extent were already discussed in, in federal utility and so the, uh, the national court uh, the national court put the question uh, to the court of justice as to the application of federal utility to these specific setting. Um, I think the, the, the answer of the court uh, is very interesting because the court distinguished uh, this case from, from federal utility if you want on a, on a technical ground because uh, um, the, the, the obligation, obligations related to cylinders of LPG are not technically covered by the gas directive. So federal utility wasn't directly applicable. Nonetheless, nonetheless, I think the court uh, uh, recognized the, the the power of uh, uh, the federal utility ruling and uh, did an interesting um, export of those principles into the field of freedom to provide services. And ultimately, I think, reached a decision based uh, essentially on, on, on proportionality, which is the key, um, the key concept for, uh, for this type of obligations and upheld the, uh, the validity of the, of the national measure. So I think it's, it's again, it's an interesting case that shows how uh, principles in the field of public service obligations which uh, find their roots in, uh, in the energy sector can then be exported uh, into other, other domains. 
Uh, I see the slide moving uh, in a way that is good <laughs> because I wanted to to move to the other case. I want to comment. Uh, maybe I'll go up just a little bit so that you have it's Akima. Uh, now we're moving from from Spain to uh, Lithuania, and uh, uh, we are in the in the energy squarely in the energy sector i think the 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 case uh the case the the, the, the aspect of the case i want to comment uh, it's about uh there are many aspects i want to comment about the interface between state aid and public service obligations uh, because here the interesting part was that the the national law Define define that public interest services a number of activities. Um, among this list, fairly long list, uh, it also included the production of electricity from renewable energy sources. And so I think the question came, and let me scroll to the point I want to to discuss with you. Uh, the question came whether the um the funds that a, a a res producer receives can be uh, considered compensation for a public service obligation and so i think this question brought to the fore immediately the interaction between uh, public service obligations uh, the altman case law and uh, um, and state aid um i think the, the the analysis of the court is very interesting and uh, i must share again a personal insight because it, it's a point on which we had uh, uh, reflected upon uh, when we prepared this book it's the moment of uh, advertising i think for for fsr because this is an fsr project of which i think all of us are very proud and uh, when we discussed the compatibility of aid for rest producers, uh, we, we discussed whether this type of aid could be covered by public service obligations. For a number of reasons, we, we excluded that. And I think it's, uh, it brought us intellectual satisfaction to say that the, 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 the Advocate General not only uh, quoted the, the, the book, but also shared the insight. Uh, I think, I think, in all fairness, the, the the part that convinced him most of our reasoning was that the, for a public service obligation, there needs to be a a, a, a an element of of compulsion. So the the, the emphasis on the obligation part, and then. Um, when you want to uh, promote production from from rest uh, you are you are more um, trying to incentivize an activity but at least in the in the legislation at, at issue there was no element of obligation so there was certainly money on the table all the incentives were there for uh, producers to 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 use that money and and produce electricity from rest but there was no obligation, and that uh, missing element for the for the advocate general and for the court uh, then was dispositive of the question: Is there a validly defined PSO? Uh, without the element of, of the, the obligatory element, there can be a, a a validly defined public service obligation. And so, with that, the the, the court was able to say. Mm, Although referring to the national court, uh, it was able to say in principle, uh, money for generating electricity from rest can be seen as compensation for a for a PSO. So I, I think again, in this case it's uh, it's interesting as uh, uh, implications for uh, other other activities, especially again in times in which we see many activities nowadays in the times we we live uh, having become uh, 
essential and and and, uh, and almost a public service, including you know our ability to 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 be connected via uh, networks. In this case, digital networks and not energy networks. I think I'll again I'll I'll stop there to hand over to Professor Hancher for the last part of the presentation. Thank you very much. I apologize. I was moving the slides as I thought misunderstood the instructions. I thought I had to check something. So I have in my session uh, the last uh, 10 minutes or so um, on two cases on uh, secondary energy legislation. Um, and one um, is uh, the Baltic Cable case, which was decided on the 11th of March and which I will shortly um, be broadcasting a podcast about. Um, again, I'll look at these three aspects. Um, so here you, you see um, that there is somewhere around here. Um, there is um, an in, there are many interconnectors in this area. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a map, the clearer indication of the Baltic Cable, which goes from Sweden um, <clears throat> to Germany. Um, this is um, what it is, I believe. Uh, it's an HV, a high voltage direct current cable. Um, I hope you can still hear me. I have lost the slides, um, but I think I can continue. Um, just see. Yes, I think we're all right. Anyway, so um, as you can see, um, then uh, there are many interconnectors, both planned um, as well as current. Uh, but what makes uh, the Baltic cable um, quite um, interesting is that it falls into a category of its own, you could say. It's a single interconnector. So it's not owned by the adjacent um, Swedish and German TSOs, as, as many interconnectors are. It's owned by um, a company based in Norway, um, Stadkraft. And uh, Baltic Cable was actually built in 1994 and has been operating since that time which meant that it couldn't qualify uh, for uh, an exemption, to request an exemption um, from the, the rules on uh, congestion revenues. And uh, we're back in the third package here again. Um, and uh, we're looking at the application of uh, Article 16.6 of the third package, uh, which provides for um, how congestion income should be dealt with. Um, now, uh, one of the problems um, with um, Article 16.6 is you could say that it's conceived really with um, a classical or regular TSO in mind. And I hope you can hear me uh, because the slides have gone again. Um, but so for a classical TSO, um, the rules made sense because what the rules required um, were essentially uh, that the TSO um, who owned and operated such an inter interconnector should not profit twice from congestion income because that kind of regular TSO would already have been charging its, its network customers uh, for that capacity obviously socialized across all its customers. And therefore, if it was able to make scarce or enjoy scarcity rents um, through um, a congested cable, then those uh, scarcity rents should somehow either be returned to the customers by lowering the tariffs, or um, the, the should be used, that revenue should be used for um, expanding uh, or investing in new interconnectors. Now, that's all very well if you're a regular TSO, um, because um, you have network tariffs that you can reduce. Um, you have ongoing uh, investment um, obligations. So it makes sense um, to, to use that revenue. But of course, you might not be able to use it um, as soon as you earn it. So Article 16.6 provides that until um, the TSO can um, use the revenue in the way um, it's required to do, um, it should put it in um, a special account in an escrow or um, an internal account where it can't touch um, the income until 
uh, the regulator uh, can give the green light and say, OK, you can use it for uh, one of the purposes um, in, um, listed in the regulation. Um, now, with Baltic Cable, the problem was um, that it didn't have any customers. Um, it only actually uh, engages in market coupling. So it doesn't have any network cu customers. And because it's a single interconnector, um, it was unlikely um, to build any new interconnectors. So the Swedish regulator, had, that's EI, had in the meantime requested um, Baltic Cable that its revenue was kept on a separate internal account, and it wasn't allowed to touch it. Um, now, that was problematic, obviously, because that was that revenue, that congestion revenue, was the only source of income for Baltic Cable. Uh, Baltic Cable challenged the regulator's decision uh, in uh, the Swedish courts, and the Swedish courts um, realized that there was a major problem here for EI, uh, because in effect, if it allowed um, Baltic Cable um, to access its income, it would be interpreting the regulation uh, contra legem and exposing Sweden to infringement actions, um, an infringement proceeding um, launched by the European Commission. Um, so what's very interesting about this case is that uh, you see it's a, it's a ruling of the third chamber of the, the Court of Justice, but um, the president of the court um, is sitting in that chamber. So uh, the reason why uh, we think he's sitting there is because um, the court was confronted with a dilemma. Could they interpret um, Article 16, Paragraph 9, um, sorry, Paragraph 6, um, to actually allow uh, the Swedish regulator to interpret that regulation contra legem? In other words, um, were they basically saying the regulation uh, could be set aside? So that's a big step. Um, and you can see that the court wasn't too keen to take that step. And instead, um, they um, recommended uh, to the Swedish Administrative Court that um, Article 16.6 could be interpreted um, in such a way that the um, single interconnector company should be treated um, properly, you could say, uh, proportionately, and uh, should not be discriminated against, and it should therefore uh, have access to that congested income so that it could cover its costs and make a reasonable return. So this is a very important case because it recognizes uh, that we don't have a one-size-fits-all approach in the sector. And um, we will see um, how this case um, is developed. Uh, this case law is developed and applied when we have many kinds of hybrid assets, uh, offshore wind farms, for example, uh, other single um, gas interconnectors coming um, through into Europe. I think this is a, an important case um, which um, applies uh, the key principles of European law uh, to interpreting complex rules in um, the regulations. Uh, of course, um, the regulation has been amended, and um, Article 19 of the new regulation, uh, electricity regulation, gives ACER the power to, to draw up guidelines on congestion revenue and its allocation. Um, and that process, um, I believe, um, is well underway. And um, hopefully, um, those guidelines will take account of all the different types of interconnectors um, that we have in Europe. Finally, um, I can see time's running out. I don't have the slides on my screen, uh, but I hope you can still hear me. Um, and that is um, then the last case is uh, the Belgian nuclear case. Um, this is actually a grand chamber um, ruling of the European Court of Justice. And what's important here, and I'll be very quick about it, uh, because uh, I'd like to leave some time for questions, is um, this case concerns um, the prolongation of the lifetime of um, a nuclear power plant in Belgium. Um, it should have been closed um, because of, of age, I believe, as, as well as um, a general decision uh, to withdraw from nuclear. But um, due to capacity constraints, uh, the Belgian government decided to extend uh, the life of that reactor by a further 10 years. Now, the question was, um, in making that decision, 
should the um, Belgian government have followed various um, environmental uh, requirements so as set out in the EIA, the Environmental Impact Assessment, and in the Habitat uh, Directive. Um, and the question there was um, whether or not those procedures had, had been properly followed or not. Um, and the challenge in the, in the, the Belgian courts was brought uh, by uh, various uh, environmental groups claiming that those directives should have been um, taken into consideration in a decision um, to prolong the lifetime of a plant, um, a plant that had been temporarily closed, I believe, and reopened. Um, and what you see here is, um, I think, the court being very uh, deferential um, and basically saying that if there really is a genuine uh, public security um, argument, um, a security of supply uh, consideration, then the national court shall, shall um, be entitled to uh, rule that those directives, those two directives, uh, should not be applied. Uh, but when it comes to the Habitats Directive, which is um, a very strict directive, in fact, um, you see that the court saying here, well, you can only set that directive aside, the requirements of that directive, if there really is a genuine threat to security of supply. So they send that um, test back to the national court. So the national court will have to establish whether or not um, keeping um, this old power station going um, is uh, required because of um, national security interests. So that then is an important ruling um, because, of course, the nuclear sector um, remains controversial. And uh, it's uh, something I think uh, we can see that the courts have uh, never really wanted to um, burn their fingers with um, and have deferred back to national courts and, in the end, to national governments to rule on, on security of supply issues. So that um, is all I'd like to say about that case. And um, maybe we can take some questions now. I, I can I can read the I can read a couple of questions. Uh, so the the first one that I like to read is uh, it starts like this: uh, Dear Professor Hancher, do you think that according to the Opal judgment, Article One Nine Four should be applicable also to the decisions issued under Article One Hundred One or One Hundred Two? In, when applied to the energy sector? If no, yes, why? I think that is a question for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right, well, um, that's a very good question. Um, and I'm sure um, that many uh, inventive uh, lawyers will be exploring the limits of the, the principle of solidarity. Um, it's addressed um, in Article 194 to the European Union and the member states, um, whereas, of course, 101, 102 uh, is primarily addressed uh, to undertakings. Um, however, um, if one was uh, looking, especially under 101, paragraph 3, uh, for uh, reasons to um, allow um, agreements or cartels um, that might be... Um, restrictive of competition, unless uh, we can exempt them under 1013, then it would be interesting um, to consider whether there's any solidarity arguments um, that might be used to, especially in these current times, um, to justify, um, in the interests of solidarity, um, companies working together. Um, maybe a very relevant example, I can throw that back at uh, Francesco, uh, the Italian competition authorities have announced that they will uh, suspend fines on cartels. That could be a form of state aid, I suppose, because um, they will they will suspend requirement to pay penalties that have already been imposed. If they were energy companies, 
Could we rely on the principle of solidarity? Yeah, no, I, I, I would like to also uh, comment on that because I think uh, from the point of view of Article 101, there are times in which uh, uh, one could rethink about the application of uh, 101 paragraph 3. Uh, and I think it, it's a good moment also to to discuss the, the, the application of competition law in general. You know that several, beyond the, what the Italian competition authority has done, several competition authorities have uh, come to the view that uh, there need to be an application of Article 101 to agreements uh, for the supply of essential goods in this time, again, that respect the, the, the the specificity of the moment we have, and I think uh, uh, a prolongation of that thinking could indeed go to how we apply Article 101.3 and, and whether energy solidarity, an agreement that embodies the principle of energy solidarity, uh, can be exempted under Article 101.3. I think the difficulty, the main difficulty with this process one is that uh, so far the Commission has been very uh, strict in in, uh, in interpreting Article 101.3. The other one is that, uh, as Professor Hancher was saying, 101 is, uh, is for undertakings. And so I think the, the, the case to be made is how undertakings take in their own hands um, public goods. So it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy um, marriage to make. Uh, but I think it's, it's a very good question. We have another question um, here um, on the uh, Opal case. Um, a very good question. And I'm hoping I can pronounce her name properly, Quadvo. Um, um, who asks whether or not um, the principle of solidarity um, could give rise um, to any um, implications for um, new member states entry or member states um, becoming member um, associating into the EU um, or countries? Um, I believe I think the question is also um, for agreements between EU member states or between the EU and third countries. Um, that, I think, is a, a, a very interesting question. Um, I, th I think on the basis of the ruling that we have, yes, I think that uh, the, the Commission will have to take into, co into consideration the impact um, of uh, any uh, agreement that it might make uh, with a third country on the solidarity um, of uh, the different member states. I think perhaps what's important to stress However, um, is that the General Court um, worded um, its interpretation of the obligation very much in procedural terms that the Commission um, should weigh up the different interests, should take them into consideration. Uh, the General Court didn't necessarily um, rule on how the Commission uh, was to conclude that some interests uh, would have to take precedence above others. Uh, what it just required was that there was a procedure, um, a transparent procedure, um, whereby um, the interests um, of the different parties was properly taken into account. So I could imagine that that principle, if it's upheld uh, by the Court of Justice on the appeal, uh, that that could be equally applied um, to um, procedures uh, for concluding treaties with even countries like uh, the UK and uh, the EU in the future. Any more questions? We have a few minutes. While we look for the questions to come up on our forum, just also to, to remind that there are many cases in the pipeline. I think we have dedicated the last two slides to pending cases. Uh, some of them, again, are related to the Acer case we discussed, but that 
that is to say that you know we certainly have a materials for another seminar soon because there are many many cases pending in the energy sector and again many of these cases will have lessons for a broader community I had also maybe one final question uh, for Francesco on the, the Repsol case. As I understood it from your presentation, um, that law had been around for many years, more than 20 years. So do you think that would have that could pass the Federal Utility Test? That's a, that's a very interesting point. I think the one of the arguments uh, that probably convinced the national judge to make the referral was exactly that the law had been in place for uh, I think exactly 18 years. I think there the court was a the court of justice was very deferential, and uh, and in spite of of, of that uh, long duration, considered that still uh, the, the the public service obligation was validly imposed. Um, I think you know the, it's a very it's a very interesting point because uh, I think uh, federal utility uh, is a case which, if you want, impinged a lot on the ability of a member state to design public service obligations. Uh, here we see the court uh, uh, taking, if you want, a step back and and giving. Uh, Returning some some re leeway to to a member state, I think in in the in the case of public service obligations, we see a lot of that. We see the court uh, proclaiming that the the, the 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 design of a PSO is the entirely in the hands of member state, and then usually in a judgment, the next paragraph go in and chip away uh, that that discretion of the member state. So I think it's a it's an interesting uh, back and forth between the court and uh, a member state on on the space of uh, public service obligation. So um, there was one more question I see um, on the on the uh, coming from the the discussion forum from Katarina. Um, who would like to know if there are any cases on cross subsidization in the energy market um, coming to, uh, coming either before the ECJ or having been handed down? It's a very good question, um, and uh, actually uh, I think an extremely topical question um, because um, you see a lot of issues uh, arising um, around uh, cross subsidization um, as we move um, into. Um, uh, sector coupling, for example, um, can we use the gas infrastructure that we have for hydrogen um, conversion? Is that a form of cross subsidization? It brings, it raises lots of questions, and I have to say, um, but maybe um, Francesco might want to um, also express an opinion. The guidance from the the courts is 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 rather thin. Uh, we don't have many cases on cross subsidization. Uh, a number way back in the past on post, um, which um, are not very satisfactory um, in trying to use either the state aid rules or the competition rules um, when it comes to trying to, to control cross subsidization. I think the lesson from the post sector at the time was you need to actually to have secondary legislation. Uh, it's quite difficult uh, to apply the treaty principles. but. Um, so there's no case law as such, as far as I'm aware. Uh, Francesco, do you want to say anything on that? No, I, a couple no, of I minutes. just want to say that you know the, the, the case law we have is very old, and uh, there are difficulties in updating and, and interpreting that and, and, and adapting it to the to the new circumstances. So I think again it's an area on which uh, certainly we will see more more development. Thanks. So I think uh, now uh, we have to actually um, wind up the presentation today. I'd like to thank uh, all my colleagues very, very much for making this possible and for all of you for, for joining today. Uh, Francesco also for his uh, 
um, excellent collaboration, as always. Um, you'll see here we've got lots of um, online events coming up. Um, so as an online uh, forum, we, we have much to offer. And with that, I'll just hand back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all for attending this event. Thank you very much. As you can see, we have more opportunities for you to join. So there is a recap here. But of course, you find all the information on our website. And uh, precisely on the quick links I uh, posted below, so you can find the slides already online, um, all the FSR uh, online events which are coming this month. We have eight. Uh, and more information and multimedia resources from the Energy Union Law area. Again, it's the third link. And then we would be very happy if you could take some minutes to uh, answer our survey on online events, to get your feedback and new ideas to improve our online events and, of course, your uh, digital experience. Uh, last but not least, this event uh, um, is recorded. So next week on the event page, and this is the last link, you will find the recording and the link to the slides again. Thank you very much to all of you for participating. And see you next time online.